This is Chloe Seinloff's biography that she left for, for us. She says, I was born in St. Elizabeth's. <laughs> and I've lived in Appleton my whole life with my two sisters and parents. I lived in a hundred year old house near Pierce Park. Once I moved to a new house, I missed the architectural features of my old house. I'm currently a senior at Appleton West High School. Two summers ago, I became irritated with the lack of architectural preservation at West and created the West Architectural Restoration Project with the support of my parents and Mr. Arches, the principal. I'm also part of Legends, the school history club, and give tours of Appleton West and interview Hall of Fame inductees. I love the rich history of West, but I participate in other co-curricular activities. I'm an avid cross-country runner, which is something I might continue in college, and I'm a member of the National Honor Society, the Link Crew, and Peer Helpers. Some people might recognize me from my popcorn stand at the Appleton Downtown Farmers Market, where I have worked for the past six summers. Right now, I am anxiously waiting for March 30th, when I find out the admissions decisions for the schools I applied to. Now, she's already heard from Minnesota, and they've said you can come up to Minnesota if you want. She's waiting to hear yet from Princeton, Yale, <laughs> Michigan. What did I leave out, kid? Did I leave out a couple? Syracuse. Syracuse. Oh, yeah, the orange men of Syracuse. Wow. I've applied to several schools with the intent of majoring in architecture and or civil engineering. Please give a warm welcome to Chloe Simon. Five years worth of yearbooks, so <laughs> it was fun. All the students at school in the library, you know, had some fun. Some old, some of our teachers went to West as well. So, 75 years ago, the cornerstone was laid for Appleton West High School or Appleton Senior High, as it was then. And 74 years ago, the school was dedicated. And at the dedication ceremony, they said, "We dedicate the school to." The perpetuation and improvement of democratic society and representative government. So but the story doesn't start with West. I'm going to give some background on the high schools that led up to West. Um, the early high schools, the first real high school in Appleton was uh, Brooks High and it was in the 1850s it was constructed and it was initially a private school and Sam Ryan actually said in 1853, why don't we create a public high school? But that didn't really fly until 18, uh, later in 1859 when the Hercules uh, building became a public school. And the Hercules building was uh, all second ward uh, school district and they received $500 from the state to maintain a public high school. So the school was free in 1876, the first time, and the first class graduated in 1878 with a whopping 10 students. But these um, 10 students were actually quite successful in becoming lawyers and doctors and so forth. So, and in 1881, the superintendent, who would later become superintendent, Carrie Morgan, graduated. So, but next we have Ryan High School. Um, which uh, was the second ward district, and it was built in 1881 18, through 1883. And it didn't just house the high school, it housed eight other grades, and it was actually a four-year high. And it was named after a pioneer family that moved to Appleton. And one of the famous graduates there was Edna Ferber, and she was one of the writers of the Clarion, which actually <coughs> still exists, and 
I have three copies of it myself. It's the uh, yearbook. So it's kind of a nice tradition. And but unfortunately, Brian High met in a demise in January 26, 1904. And but in a way that was kind of a mixed blessing because it united the school district. Previously to that, it had been divided into wards. So the school decided to build a united school district with the Morgan Building High School, first out to high school in 1904. And it cost over $100,000. And there was a dispute <coughs> over the school colors, and which I find is interesting. Um, there, the third district school was green and red, and Ryan High was white and purple colors. So they tried to compromise, but didn't really work out, so they ended up with orange and blue. And the reason they picked orange and blue was it was Yale school colors. So that was interesting. Um, and the principal at Morgan was H.H. H. Helpley. And she went on to. Huh? Oh, okay. Everything else. Um, so, and uh, the school expanded quickly, and they had to utilize basements, and it was just it was not suited for the size that Appleton was um, rapidly expanding. So, uh, several sites were proposed for the new Appleton High School, and um, the sites were uh, North Herb or Salm. State Street, Riverview Country Club, uh, the Morgan site, they would uh, tear it down and create or add on to it, Badger Avenue, City Park, Schneider Park, Pierce Park, or Spencer Street. And um, on October 7th, 1936, they had a vote, and it was a 7-7 vote split between um, Spencer Street and Badger Avenue. And um, actually, it was John Goodland, the mayor at the time, who had the deciding vote. And he uh, chose the Bad Avenue site. And so that's where West starts in this history. And ironically enough, um, Spencer Street site is Goodland, Goodland Field. And um, ironically, that becomes part of West in the 90s. So, so the structure at the school. Now, I had to admit, I love the architecture of the school, so I probably will concentrate on that inadvertently. But um, Alpton West, or Alpton Senior High School, was the first million dollar school in the state. And it was built, it started in 1937, but it took three referendums before that to agree on how much it would cost, whatever. And um, it was a works progress administration at the end of the Depression. And the federal government granted Appleton four hundred thousand dollars towards the school. The school had three floors and one tower, still does. Um, and actually, right here, you guys might be wondering what this is. <laughs> yeah, thank you. This is. Um, I'll be inserting my little anecdotes. Um, once the article was published in the Post Present, I met quite a few individuals. This is a window, the, one of the original windows from the tower. And um, Rich Erickson, uh, one of the old shop teachers, used to stand uh, in the shop and had a direct view uh, the hallway where they brought stuff out to the dump. And so and he came in and we walked through school and actually I found quite a few things that had been repurposed that I didn't know belong. I learned something new every day about the school. So he brought me that window for me to keep. Um, side note, I also have, I don't know if anybody read the article in September, but I also have uh, three huge front doors, uh, foyer doors at my house, and two Craftsman Shield, shield flags that I'm currently restoring. So I have a little collection of my own West at home. So, but back to the story of West. Um, it was a huge building, and it took 770,000 7, pounds of steel, and it has 2,100 keys, two of which I have here, <laughs> the old skeleton keys. And there are more as they redid the keys, and I went into the um, building managers, and I feel terrible for him because he has a box of 
team about this thing. That's <laughs> what belongs to what the lockers, the cabinets. But anyway, and there were 3,700 steel lockers and a 100 foot tall smokestack, which is still there but not used, and three 15 ton boilers. Now, these boilers, which were originally coal, actually lasted 70 years. They just replaced them about five years. And now they have two, but um, it's just remarkable. I think the lifespan they say for these ones are like 15 to 30 years. So I, I couldn't believe that they lasted that long. Um, just shows the workmanship in the school at the time. So the school was classified as modern American, the architecture style was, without being too modernistic. That is the direct quote from the yearbook. And the architects were Ashweiler and Ashweiler a firm on Milwaukee and Smith and & Brandt, which works locally. And Eschweiler, um, actually, um, I don't know if you, most of you probably been in Milwaukee, there's the Gaslight Building, Gaslight Company, or, um, and uh, they are the architects for that as well. And um, something I learned from Eschweiler is he, the mo there are motifs on the outside west of particularly about the auditorium, let's say drama, sculpture, and art. And um, that was kind of his trademark for his buildings. He also did an elementary school in Milwaukee, and he did on on steps, front steps of, of the school, he had motifs showing fairy tales and um, nursery rhyme characters. So, I so, but the school was designed with four parts, the academic, the gym, the auditorium and the shop unit. And personally, my favorite part of the school is the auditorium. Um, it looks completely different now in the inside than it did then, but the pictures of the, I don't know if you saw it in here, the pictures of the original auditorium were just stunning. It was uh, seated 1,654 people, and it was cherry red with white plaster walls and rocks. And um, it had marble parquet floors in the lobby area, which we just unearthed the uh, last three years. There we did it. And um, something I was particularly touted about was the uh, soundproof uh, music rooms. That was um, something they write about in your books, which I thought was interesting. And the stage was the largest in Appleton and in the area until the PAC was built. Thousands. So, and it still has original touches such as the weight system, and um, I know uh, the drama students particularly like that. It's interesting to learn how to use the old weight system for the curtains and everything. And uh, funny story, the podium. Now I heard the first principle was short, so uh, and so the, we have a small podium, which. It's kind of funny now because we have a very tall principal. Uh, Mr. Harches is probably about 6'5". And he gets on the stage for award ceremonies and has to go like this <laughs> for the podium, the original Alton High School podium. But it suits us just fine for our athletic director, Mr. McQuaid, who's about 5'5". Five, five. Uh, but they, we believe that that's the podium that the first principal used. So it's nice to have that continuation there. Um, so but the, on the opposite side of the building is the gym, and we originally only had one gym, and it was later named Symes, but it didn't have a name to begin with. Symes was a uh, basketball coach, later. and uh, the gym was bragged about because it had these bleachers that would retract, and it also had three uh, balconies on all three sides. And um, it's still used, and um, that's also a very cool part of the school. And around the school, or around the gym, were um, handball courts, and we don't have those anymore. I'm not even sure what they look like. And but you still see shuffle boards surrounding the outside of the gym, and there are ping pong tables. And um, the athletic field, ironically enough, was um, it was considered one of the finest in the in the um, state. And oh, and for gym, it was separate um, girls and guys gym. And um, 
<laughs> doing the tours. I love to, I always learn something new, and um, every tour I do, if, if there's alumni, they always talk about those infamous blue suits. And <laughs> I got some nice. And, and even in the pictures, you can see the uniform blue suit. So, so it was required for gym class for girls. So the academic wing, um, there are 75 classrooms, and there's a few more with some add-ons now. And there are sewing rooms, kitchens, a speech room, which uh, has a mini stage, and that's still there. Um, and the early American room, which was for activities. And of all the places in the school, the early American room is probably one of the most well-preserved. It has uh, pine paneling and, uh, and uh, parquet floors and Venetian blinds, very rustic. And the furniture, everything, you just feel like you're stepping back. And there are two portraits. That's another thing I forgot to mention. When West was built, there was $5,000 worth of artwork also donated which was an incredible amount of money to spend for artwork at that time. And um, it's still, in the early American room, there's two portraits of a man and a woman, and nobody knows who they are, but um, they've been there since 1938. You can see in the background yeah. of all the club pictures. So, but what's nice about West, too, when they did the design was they had a courtyard so that all the, all the classrooms in West have uh, windows, and a lot of windows. And originally the windows were painted, so it's a little bit different look now. The library was initially called the Edna Ferber Library, but when they built the new library, it's now called the Ruth Milkey Library. And it could hold 140 students, and had two study halls on each side, and held a collection of originally 9,000 and that areas had parquet floors as well, and um, a huge library desk in the middle. The shop or in auto classes were separate from the school with a 122 <coughs> foot passageway, and that was so that in case of a fire, you wouldn't lose the entire school, you just lose the shop. Just so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but throughout the school, there are some details that you don't find in newer schools. You have um, marble, and something that some West uh, students like, I don't know, it's kind of random, but uh, we have marble in our bathrooms. So we like to, uh, something unique. And um, there are also, there's also marble in the hallways, up to about here, halfway up, and in the windowsills. And there are art, there used to be arch hallways, but in 1978 or so, they had to close them off uh, with fire doors, fire code. So there's also subway tiles on the ceilings, oak trim above the lockers, crown molding, and art deco handles, which I have an example of. Sorry, I, I couldn't bring the all three doors <laughs> like I wanted to. <laughs> My dad kind of gets tired of lugging them around. But um, I do have one of the handles, and I think that they are pretty cool. They are Art Deco. And actually, um, I have my own little story about these handles. Um, with the doors, I tried to, I contacted the company that made these, Sargent, over the summer. And um, I sent the pictures, model numbers, and like, can you find these? Do you have any information on this? And they were so nice and they looked through their warehouses but they could not find anything similar and um, so I think they're unique <laughs> um, maybe just West or you know a certain time period where there weren't many made the closest I've seen is actually at high music they have something similar on one of their outside doors with the stuff up, stuff up so so and the school is also outfitted with Kohler sinks and there were water fountains and there's still one original water fountain that we are probably going to restore soon. And they are unique because they have peacock tiling. And they're actually, um, the tile is specially made and it's orange and blue to match the school. So it's um, really neat. And um, throughout the school, like I said, I, I learned something new every day about the school or I noticed something. I'll be walking through the hall 
And I think some people think I'm crazy because all of a sudden they'll be walking to class and I'll see a ceiling panel missing and I'll stop and I'll look at it and my friends will be like, what are you looking for? <laughs> and I'm like, you can see the crown molding. What are you <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> but, and one, actually one day, I'm getting off topic here, but one day I just get, stopped there and stared at this because there's this freight thing, but there weren't any doors. And I'm like, what was this for? It's kind of a mystery. And another kid just stopped and was looking too, and he's like, what's going on? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, there's small details. Um, the attention detail continues to be me. There are, there's a pineapple, which is a uh, universal sign of welcome, on the principal's door, which opens to the front foyer. And um, all, many of the d doors are inlaid. It looks like there's just a strip painted on, but they're all inlaid wood. And um, actually, the step-up pattern and these uh, handles was actually replicated in some of the cabinet pulls they have handles that are like miniature, like three inches, but they still match this. <coughs> so the attention to detail is extraordinary. Um, there are also Art Deco lights and uh, pane windows, um, but I think the pane windows got to be a pane. <laughs> 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 so do that for this. Um, when they broke, they had to replace the pane and had a cock come up. And in the 70s, uh, there's a movement to everything new energy efficient, not really anymore, but um, they're replaced. But we'll get to more of that later. Um, the grounds of Allison High, there are one mile of sidewalks and drives, and uh, there's originally a three-tiered fountain in front of the school, but it was taken down um, like three years after school was built, and there's a headline in one of the papers where it was just a bunch of leftovers anyway. And um, they decided to take it out and put gardens in instead. But you can still see it on some other pictures. And something that you kind of see now, but not really, are bike racks. Uh, there are five uh, bike racks to accommodate 500 bikes. And we, that's why I have parking issues. <laughs> so, but, um, the blending the new and the old from the Morgan Building High School to the new Alpha High School. Um, some things that carried on from the old high school was the Clarion, which was the um, yearbook. And while Morgan at the Morgan Building and Ryan High, um, it was a monthly publication, but slowly it became a year-long yearbook publication. And that was the one that Edna Ferber wrote articles for when she went to school. Um, some other things that continued were was the annual se senior play, uh, the presentation of the Craftsmanship Shield Board plaque, and that still is something that we do today. Um, student council dances uh, continued. The school colors never changed. And some rules like hats off, no smoking or drinking in school. That, that followed as well. Um, the terror mascot. And um, I learned this just a couple years ago, but the terror mascot, a terror, what's a terror? Um, a terror is a cross between a fox and a wolf because Alpson Watts is situated between the fox and the wolf. That's kind of what I did when I learned. <laughs> so uh, they also had the homecoming parade down College Avenue and had this huge I wish we could do now, but that's probably not going to happen. And um, they also had the same principal, Mr. Hobley. I <laughs> just love my country act. I say that. And so he was there for 39 years, and he was succeeded by another principal who was there, um, and I've actually met him, um, Mr. Emmett Cox. And um, he was there for a very long time. So the typical school day in 1938 was a little bit different than it is. Um, they went to school at 8.15 a.m. She was a little jealous of I go to school at 7.39. And um, there were four 55-minute classes and a lunch hour that spanned from 11.50 to 1.15. And afterwards, they come back. And well, and during lunch, they had the option of playing shuffleboard or dancing or ping pong. 
and um, but they would come back at 1.15 and they'd have fifth hour. And after fifth hour, there'd be a 45 minute homeroom. Now this is where I love doing the tours again because I learned the stuff that I wouldn't know otherwise. And um, during homeroom, they would, um, two days a week, go to the auditorium and you were assigned seats. And so they knew exactly if somebody was missing from your <laughs> and actually, I've done tours, and I've had uh, past alumni, and they know exactly where their seat is. <laughs> and they go and they sit in their seat. It's so great. Um, but uh, so there was no getting out of homeroom. Uh, but in two days a week, they did administrative stuff like electing their class president, um, report cards, that sort of thing. And so after homeroom, they'd have their six hour, and school ended at three forty-five, which I guess about that because I get done at 310. But um, just for comparison, we now have eight hours. They're 50 minutes. We only have a 10 minute homeroom, but sometimes they have extended homeroom. Um, and uh, there's no mandatory lunch period. You can actually go eight hours without having lunch now. So uh, you have a, the graduation requirements are also a little bit different. Uh, you have 14, you had to have 14 credits and um, one and a half had to be physical education, a half had to be um, science, two were history, and two were English. And I found it interesting, like, math wasn't a requirement, but, um, and uh, the rest was all electives. So some clubs that existed in 1938 were the Girls' Reserves, brings out the best in every girl, um, <laughs> High Y, which was uh, sophomore boys, Triangle, which was junior boys, the Girls Athletic Association, that's something that's different too. Um, there was not sports for girls. And that was something that would change in the 70s. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, there are language clubs and drama, and uh, there's a musical in the spring, and so forth. Publications, you have the Talisman, which was a school paper, and that's still printed today. It's still under the same name. The Clarion, which we talked about, was the yearbook. Patterns of Startups, also still around. It's a literary magazine that comes out once a year. And the Student Handbook. Um, so, West, you know, 1938, four years, you know, a couple years later was World War II. And the war era really changed West. And the 1943 Clarion was dedicated all to the war. And um, actually, also, side note, um, the early yearbooks, I really had a lot of fun looking at because everyone had a theme um, up until like the 80s and the last theme one was like Sports Illustrated, but um, just something that's neat. And so the theme of the 1943 was uh, aviation and war. So the education was one of the big changes during the wartime. Um, sewing classes focused on reusing old clothes and sewing stuff for the Red Cross. Our class, the art class, did a shield with stars for those who had died during the war. Gym uh, class is dedicated to training the for military boys. Um, in science, boys learned about aeronautics. And history, they omitted the colonial period, which I thought was interesting. And they said, a thorough understanding of our war government was gained from an intense, intensive survey of the transition from a peace to a wartime government the responsibilities and privileges associated with democracy. So they had changes in the curriculum and history. They focused mostly on present events. And uh, they also, students were encouraged to give victory talks to local mm -hmm. organizations. And war stamps and bonds um, drives would help. There was a buy a Jeep campaign where you bought $900 collectively, or through uh, war bonds, and that was enough to buy a Jeep. And the schools uh, awarded a Minuteman flag, which is something that was usually reserved for war production plants. So it was an honor for Watts to get that. The war production plants had to have 90% of the people that worked there donate to the war bonds. So that was quite an honor to store the most. Um, also, um, there are many uh, veterans and um, students that worked in war, but probably one of the most well-known was John Bradley, and he, there's a memorial in front of West, along, along with another the World War II memorial, but John Bradley was flag raiser at Iwo Jima, 
and his son wrote plays for others. And um, one other thing about West is the basement was dubbed the bomb shelter, which I think is cool. Somebody called that. But and something that I learned that um, has not happened is kind of a mixed blessing. But you know that big storm that um, that caused a big power outage this fall um, actually blew in two of the stained glass windows at West. And um, it was unfortunate, they were damaged, but through that we learned some interesting things. So I'll have Linda Muldoon come up here. here. And talk about it. Well, in September, um, Valley Glass paid a visit to Coventry Glass Works, which is the company I own. <clears throat> and they brought in these two windows, well, barely brought them in. They brought in a box of splinters and two windows with their frames almost falling off. The reason the windows blew in is that the frames were so rotted, the frames and all blew in to the inside during that windstorm. Well, I learned that there were six windows, and <clears throat> when we first saw them, there was a signature on one of the windows. This is part of the serendipity that first the storm blew them in, they became all of a sudden known to people. Second, one of the ones that was broken had the signature of the studio that made them. It was J&R Lamb Company. And I went, really? That's famous. <laughs> and um, that afternoon I was on the phone to J&R Lamb Company, still in existence, in New Jersey. It's the oldest live stained glass decorating company in the country. It started in 1857. They're still in existence. All of their windows are listed in the Library of Congress, including the six windows actually seven. There's a missing window, by the way. Six windows that are in Appleton West are listed in the Library of Congress. Oh, I'm worried. No, and no one knew they were there. I mean, they did, but they didn't. They were upstairs, the mezzanine of the auditorium. There was, there's buildings sort of in front of it, so from the front of the building you can't see them, but they do, did get daylight brought all this attention to the windows that what are we going to do with the windows um, the windows well this is one of them um, this is how this one came in yeah this is a piece of plastic these are broken pieces actually together with the two windows there are almost 40 pieces of broken glass and all of them were hand painted and fired back in 1942 um, what I learned from the people at J&R Lamb Company was that really we signed them still in 42? Um, and if you can decipher what the reading is or writing is on the windows, could you let us know because the handwriting here stinks. So we don't really know what it said. This one says, service to the state. It's a female judge. I remind you, this is 1942. <laughs> it's a female judge. <laughs> um, that was like one of my first reactions. Like, you've got to be kidding. Um, the next window. Yeah, that one, the way that one came. This is how it. Okay. Back to you. This is the rest restored window. Oh. You're not supposed to tell that we were there, so that's the point. It's supposed to look like it originally did. <clears throat> not only is it a judge, but. Do you recognize the buildings at the very top? It's the Supreme Court building and the Capitol in Washington. Each one of these windows has a little scene that would represent what they were talking about. Yeah. Okay, this is the homemaker. So you see a home and a church. Actually, these words were missing, and I called the second time to J&R Lamb, and they looked up to see what it said. They said, we can't make it out. <laughs> But I figured it out. It was homemaker. Um, and actually, I'll have them on the table over there if you'd like to see. These are two body parts. <laughs> this is a foot. <laughs> and this is two hands. And what this one was right here, and this one's here. They were totally broken and have been replaced. The six windows. Um, <clears throat> there was Pioneer Woman. There was a scientist, that was a man. There was an educator, that was a man. There was a nurse, and it said, service to humanity. 
Then there was service to the state and the homemaker. Four out of six, ladies. <laughs> Four out of six. And I had heard from the principal, the current principal, that there had been a controversy because of the homemaker. Like, is that really what we want our women to? Well, four out of six, <laughs> and a female judge. I say that's pretty good. Uh, so, anyway, that's what I told him too. <laughs> like, I think that's pretty good. Why don't you put them someplace better? Um, I've done some research on J and R Lamb Studios since then. It's been almost as if it's been falling into my lap rather than um, me pursuing it. Uh, <clears throat> The company is extraordinary, and it has had a family own it up until the um, 1980s. And they had a lot of female designers had, had, that had to do with this particular set of, uh, well, this studio. They competed with Tiffany, and sometimes won. Um, to, just to put it in perspective, what ballpark they were playing in. It wasn't they were just a small studio in New York, New Jersey. They were competing with the big guys. And Appleton has one of the few J&R Lamb's windows in the state. I said, how many J&R Lamb windows are there in the state? Very few. Certainly no other school. And the lady I talked to there said, we're not sure why, but I'm, I'm thinking that Milwaukee had a lot of gang left studios during that period of time because of the German immigrants. And so probably there were just that many in competition, so they got the uh, they got the jobs. But that doesn't mean they weren't worth having here. Um, what are the what's going to happen to the windows? They've all been restored. The two have been restored, and they are now back at the school. They are putting them in the small lobby coming into the auditorium, backlit from the display cases that are there, with the history of the windows and Jay and Arlene's studios. <laughs> I think it's wonderful, it's like a whole discovery. Supposedly based off of windows in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I looked these up as well, and you can see the figure and the idea of a geometric background, but other than that, the ones at Appleton are much better. I mean, they truly are. And the ones in Bay Ridge, they go through arts, sciences, literature. I mean, they're basically saying things that the students should uh, strive for. So hopefully, <laughs> we will see a new dedication of these windows sometime soon. Um, when they are installed in the public and see them, they were initially dedicated and purchased by the student council um, and dedicated to the men and women of, who served in World War II. And you think about it though, they were installed in May of 1942. That's like six months, less than six months, um, after Pearl Harbor. And it takes a while to make six windows. And here's the mystery about the missing window. There were seven windows. No one seems to know where the last window is or was. It was of the Minuteman. Which is interesting when you mentioned Minuteman earlier. And of course that would be a symbol of the, the, the citizens at the ready to, to fight. No one seems to know where it, where it is. No one at the facilities department, the principal. So if any of you out there, there's someone with a minute man window, <laughs> about this tall and about this wide. <laughs> What's the source of knowing that there was a set in the Clarion or in both. manufacturing? Both. 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 And then the post as well. The post crescent itemized the windows because it, originally it was a wooden plaque saying these were dedicated to the men and women of World War II. And then in 1946, a, the brass plaque, which is there now, is, took its place. And there was an article, actually Karen <laughs> found it for me, um, in the 1946 post crescent about the brass plaque. And it listed the and mentioned seven. And in the clarion, it mentioned seven. and. The um, studio originally had listed seven. One was a little, little bit different size. That would have been the They would be right there. But I think they built this up here so that you couldn't see no, the road anymore. 
but you used to be. <coughs> I actually back a little. Yeah, they're like they're kind of partially underneath this, but you could actually see them. This is when the first school still built, first built. See when they were installed. Yeah, but that's where they were, right here. I've been in the basement of the high school, and there's a huge switch room um, for the original. And they also have some of the original pane windows down there still. And the basement is huge. It's you know probably up to this, this wall right here. And um, yeah, there's original full-size pane windows still down there, and you can see the inner workings of the windows. Yeah. And that was everywhere in the high school to begin with. And, um, but I went through, um, and I've been in the tunnels underneath the school. I've been backstage and on the catwalks. Oh, kind yes. of a hobby of mine. Where do the tunnels go to? Well, there's, there's a myth that the tunnels go connect to Wilson, but that's untrue. <laughs> oh, yeah. One last thing about the windows, and this is just again another strange serendipity. Um, in that, um, while I was working on repainting some of these pieces, someone had lent me a book called Clara and Mr. Tiffany, and it's basically a historical novel that basically talks about Clara Driscoll, who was a head designer for Tiffany Studios for many years. And she's the one who invented most of the lamps and designed most of the lamps. And right as I'm working on these lamb windows, in that book, she says, oh, and I got a letter today from Frederick Lamb congratulating me on my win at the Paris Exposition for the dragonfly lamp and asking me to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and so she goes to lunch, and of course, they're offering her a job to come over and do the lamps that she's in our lamb studios. And she's looking around the studios and, and asks, well, do you have any women working here? No, not yet. See, Clara Driscoll had an entire women's department at Tiffany Studios that she was in charge of. They were not unionized and they're not as well paid as the men, but yet they liked working together. She liked the light at the Tiffany Studios and had no design credit, actually. <laughs> In other words, it was Tiffany's name on just about everything, no matter who designed it. I mean, that's just the way he worked. Lamb Studio said, and we'll give you design credit. And she said, no, I like the light and I like the women better. Oh. And she stayed with Tiffany, and I think she had a little secret crush on him too. <laughs> it, was, it was just amazing to me how many things fall in place, or maybe it is just you're aware of them because you're doing one thing, and then you see all these things kind of fit in that maybe they've been there anyway. So that's my story. Yeah. Oh, what they'll, they'll be put up. It was decided that they were not placed in, um, you cannot see them anymore. Many people did not know. And um, once we discovered the value and the meaning behind them, we couldn't have them put back up in such an insignificant place. So they will be placed in the foyer and will be protected. The next big change was the construction of East High School, and that's where uh, the west part of the name was added to Allison uh, Senior High. But on, at West now, it's still, the motif over the front doors is still Allison out, out Senior High. So it's kind of nice. But then, following the 60s, was a big period of architectural change and uh, growth in the school. Um, in 1972, the school saw its first add-on with the 19, or with the with the LGI large construction room in the back of the school and some extra classrooms. In 1976, the uh, Badger Pool was built, and um, it was later uh, renamed the Zepka Aquatic Center, named after the and in 1978, fire doors were placed in the school, and it used to be really open. Um, you could see down the entire hall. Um, and then the big change, which is kind of controversial now looking back, but um, not a lot of thoughts put into decision, is in 1979 and 1980, they gutted the auditorium. And um, that's the thing that probably saddens me the most about the school is because the original auditorium was just phenomenal. They had thick plaster columnades and the acoustics were incredible. And um, in late 70s, 
the desired sound was not to have the reverberations. It was a dead sound. So they got to the auditorium and put up these big soundboards. And instead of putting the new auditorium walls up and over the old, they completely tore out the old. Mm -hmm. So there are still some fragments of the uh, plaster walls, which I've seen. And I learned, which you can't see from a black and white photograph, is it wasn't just white. Um, the, actually, the plaster was uh, colorful. It had orange and green. Um, painted on it. And again, the detail. Um, on the outside of the school, between the first and second windows, which I encourage you guys, like, I, I know you guys probably seen walks several times, but if you're ever just walking by, walk closer to school, look at all the motifs and everything, the detail. And, but there's a um, pattern, and they continued that on the wall of the auditorium. And um, so, some big changes, and actually it went from being cherry red, and now it's all blue, the auditorium, the inside. Um, that was completed just a couple years ago, they changed out the upholstery and the seats. But that started in 1979. And um, the expansion of the city, and uh, you know, adjusting to future needs, I mean, you didn't foresee a need for computer labs and everything then. And also a big thing was the indoor athletic facilities to begin with. Um, we were outgrowing the one um, science gym. And in 1988, was last year, the science gym was used for the varsity basketball games. And the Emanuel gym was built. And um, that is the gym that is like almost on the sidewalk there. And um, there's also, uh, a fitness center constructed above Simon's gym. It's a glass wall, and you can see you can look down the Simon's gym from the fitness center. But um, also another thing that outgrew its original location was the library. And the original library was only could only accommodate 140 students, which you can kind of see as a problem, especially with computers. So they faced quite the dilemma for some time. They um, at first, there's a tech ed addition which cut into the courtyard, and they that they took that and they had the um, library in two different spots. They had the reference section in the original library, and then the fiction section. And then, but eventually, the, uh, there became a need for the, the new library, which is the new Milwaukee Library. So now we've talked about the architecture. I'll just briefly go over some of the social things that are going on. Um, so, in 1973, uh, girl sports was added, and um, that was big. The first, um, it wasn't all at once. I know cross country wasn't until the later 70s, but um, basketball was 1973. And in the 60s and 70s, you had the hippie age, and you had uh, Amnesty International, was a big group. And there's a story, uh, West had all these little stories, they find out from the staff. You have uh, many staff have been there for 30 years or more. And um, there's a water bomb during one of the protest rallies. And it w landed in the early American room. And fortunately, for whatever reason, there were firemen across the street working on something. They were able to uh, clean it up quickly, and it didn't cause any damage. And um, in the 80s, you had uh, the addition of the computer club. And um, in about that period of time, gymnastics, which is a huge sport, um, kind of diminished and it's no longer a sport offered at West. And um, also during the 80s and 90s, I learned that um, George Bush Sr. actually, during his campaign, wanted to run on, you know, he was a runner, and he wanted to run on a track. And he, uh, he they brought him to, uh, to the West. And he made the comment, you guys still have a cinder track. And, uh, which brings us to one of the things that's been going on lately. Um, the Girl with the Blast is now um, the track project, which I'm sure everybody has kind of heard in some way, shape, or form. And um, like I said, in 1999, they acquired what could have been the original site of Alpha Blast, that's Goodland Field, which is now Neen House. Um, which is given to West by Mary Bethany House golf, uh, golf coach. 
much and she took care of us for many years. And um, so that became soccer and uh, baseball, softball fields. And now, if you drive by, we now have a new track, which we are all very excited about, and um, new lights. So that is the newest addition to the bus. And uh, I guess I will stop there. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, did you park some, you do acquire some buildings so that you're going to add on now, is that correct? Well, we just we have some separate land parcels like and like uh, three years ago we acquired a land for parking lots, but as far as structures it's just the original building that we have now. There's just add ons in the back of it. I think I read in the paper that uh, Yeah, I'm wrong. I, I thought that I read in the paper that you had acquired uh, several homes. Yes. So they yes. Yes. That's that's right. Right. Oh, that was for the track. The part of the whole they're whole demolished. Track. Yeah. They're demolished. Yeah. The track the place. The whole maze is Yes. How many streets do they have? I think um, the capacity was originally 1,800 students, but I think they, I don't think they had a many. It was about 1,500. How many students? 1,500. So, yeah. Is there still a terrorist den? Terrorist den? Like, uh, what was that? Okay, at the old YMCA, yeah. which is downtown. The, and this is back uh, late 40s, 50s, 60s. The uh, Appalachian West actually had their own home. It was called the terrorist den. Oh, really? And we did dance the right stuff. Huh. No, not that and I never came up on the clarion. Never came up on that? No, actually, I was very surprised. The, the clarion was very uniform from year to year. Um, I I want to delve deeper. I'm going to have to look at the talisman. I believe it will happen to that because it was very interesting. Um, it was just kind of like homecoming clubs, spring or spring musical fall play. Hey, we we'll your book editor in 1970. Yeah, so you probably went through one every year. Yeah. Oh yeah, I went through all of them. Every single year, but nothing escaped me. <laughs> all right, um, China. Yes. An acquaintance of mine lives in a very, very small house that he said is over 100 years old it's in the 1300 block of Paris Street. He said that house was originally on the site where Appleton High School was built, and that that house and a few others had to be moved. Do you know anything about that? No, I, I had the first day heard of it. Um, I was just told it's an open field, but I heard it was from across from a farm. But that's interesting. I learned something new all the time. Yeah, I think this house was was very small and was probably when it was built it was outside the city limits that uh, um, conformed to city building codes. And um, anyway, it, it was you know, it was probably expendable when when the Appleton High School was being built, along with some other ones. But you don't really know anything about. That. No, I can't say to you. Um, actually, it was kind of west. The proposed site for us at Bad Avenue was controversial, kind of, well, not really controversial, but a lot of people didn't want to because it was the outskirts of town, which we kind of scoff at now. It's in the middle of town. But, uh, yes. Yes? You know, I just recently got a letter uh, telling me that they were contacted all the football alumni from Appleton High School and they're, uh, they're, they want a home football field. Are they planning on putting a football field inside the track? Is that yes. because they were going to dedicate that to Abe Dillon, one of the uh, a long time coach up there? And I was kind of curious if it is that field going to be the home field of Appleton West then? Eventually, um, there are three phases to the project. The first phase was uh, uh, six tennis courts, which was already completed in 2009. The second phase was the track. And just like a practice field, like right now we have and lighting, we have lighting, but we need um, we need bleachers, and I believe it's like another million of dollars. So Where is that going to go inside the track, like like Appleton East is in, or? It would be on one side. It wouldn't be there. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't be like Lawrence where you have on both sides. It'd just be all on one side. Oh, all okay. The, the seating, you mean? Yes, okay. all the seating. So that's how they would accommodate that. For the school or rural? 
It's got to be towards the school because the track is way over towards me. Yeah, it would be on the side of the school. So but that's the next phase, and that probably will not be for a while. I believe the the lease with Bantable is an off for a couple more years too. So that's going to be farther down the road. But we're very close to finishing our second phase of the project. I know um, uh, the Happels, which are two longtime teachers, they dedicated or they donated a large sum, and uh, Mary Beth Eatonhouse again helped out a bit. So we're very close to our goal. Um, yes. When I was an incoming student in Appleton West, A.J. Chelby was pr uh, principal. And I can recall going into the auditorium and he made the statement that I, there will be no booing and kissing at any sporting event <laughs> because it will drive the opposing team nuts. So no booing, no kissing, only cheering for your team. And you shut up the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I heard he ran a very he tight did. He ran a very <laughs> tight <laughs> shot. Yeah. Her? I don't think if you her. Don't, if you caught, he was there practically at every event. I will see you in my office in the morning. <laughs> he was a tough nut. I was reading this book and it had excerpts of, uh, it must have been from like newspapers or I don't know, or students talking about it, but they said that, uh, yeah, he there there's no need for hall monitors with him. <laughs> that he would wander around and he would make sure, it, he must have been pretty imposing. He was uh, a very short man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he was five yeah. four. I don't think he was 5'4", but he ruled with an iron hand. And there, you didn't misbehave. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Hoxton, he's not very tall either. Oh. And the two, uh, the Warner, two, uh, Woody, Warner Woody wasn't much taller, but he did the discipline. Oh, okay. I found it really interesting that the decision for uh, where to put the high school had to be had to be decided by the, the tiebreaker by the mayor because our presentation a couple of uh, months ago, Emily, what, what else got decided? It was uh, when they, in the 1890s when they were, when the city council was voting on whether to build a, a public library and, and the, they kept, a, the council kept getting a tie vote for and against the library building and the tie kept being broken by the mayor. And they had to have a decision by uh, a judge to say what was legal. And so it's just interesting that the two, two of the biggest public buildings had the same problem. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. At the time that they chose that Badger Avenue site, was Badger Avenue Highway 10 at that time? Um, I'm not exactly yes, sure. It was. it was? Okay. I can remember going to circuses across the street from them. Really? Yeah, I heard. I, I did read that that it was close to the So yeah, I found out a lot of stuff. Um, I've been in pretty much every part of Boston, except for maybe that. I don't know if I've been there. But um, one of the neatest, like like I said before, probably the neatest part of the school though is the auditorium. You go back on the catwalks, and there's there's also a room called the Maryland. And so the, I don't know if anybody's heard of this, I don't know how far back this goes even, but there's a painting of Marilyn Monroe and it's not even really a room, but there's like uh, a stand where they put chairs and stuff. And people like to look like, yeah, you know, on the street. Yes? Um, it actually, women's sports, they have basketball on Saturday at Lumen, and then I played on a team. Oh, really?
and um, everybody got to parade past this room, and it was very a uh, big downer. I mean, because that room, you know, meant yeah. a lot to everyone. Yeah. And then um, you had to go buy that oh, yeah. to go into the for the pep rally to go to state. And I mean, so it was really an amazing transformation to get fired up to go to state after, you know, like the principal, um, Mr. Yeah. did a really good job of working that together to get, because it was, people were fine. I mean, it was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, they must have did a good job. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, you cannot tell. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. maybe a corner in the early marriage room where the ceiling tile is their state, but yeah. the rest of it is hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I didn't know. Can I just, one second, can I, how many of you are out in high school West grads? I'm just kidding. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, I just like, yeah. Wow, great. Yeah. Yeah, I have my mother, uh, Gloria, from which I graduated, which is now from the Rosa Carey Morgan School. And going through her clarion, uh, there was an Adela Club who taught English and I had a telecom for a homeroom teacher in my three years of high school. And she, my mother had her as an English teacher in the military school. Mm -hmm. And that's that's something that another thing that we're very proud of at West is we had, especially when North opened up, a lot of teachers were given the opportunity to go to North, but many or even like almost forced to go there because they need to fill these positions and you know the West was kind of overflowing at that point in time but many stayed at West because they just loved it so much and I know one of my teachers is probably I think he's like 65 and he hasn't retired yet and he loves it <laughs> Sir Marcy um, and then we had yeah several several teachers like that have been there for like 20 plus years we have several I think we have like five teachers right now who we even graduated from West so we had some fun going through some yearbooks and finding some pictures of them. <laughs> so are there any other questions? 